Good afternoon. Let me share my screen here. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about a group of organisms that I've worked with for the past 40 years. For the purposes of this art and science talk, I'm going to talk about some of the things that make them successful parasites, which are their weapons of microdestruction, as well as some of the things that we've learned over the past decades. But I'm going to do something a little bit different here and weave together art and science using both my own work and that of some of my collaborators. So who am I? As a researcher, I'm in the Department of Microbiology and I'm interested in the diseases that affect fish, particularly the parasites that wild fish encounter. While most of my research is conducted here in the Pacific Northwest, this research has taken me around the world and introduced me to a broad network of scientific collaborators. But I'm also a glass artist, and I also often try to use that medium to tell a story. In many ways, the scientific and artistic processes are similar. We ask questions, we experiment with processes, and we pull the put together pieces to tell a story. So I'll introduce you first to the fish parasites I study. They belong to a group called Mixozoans. And there are thousands of species in this group. And each species forms two very different spores in the two hosts. That it requires to complete the life cycle. So this would be an actinospore released from an invertebrate host, and this a mixospore released from a vertebrate host. And as you can see from this plate, these spores can be quite beautiful and extremely varied in their morphology. The species that I've worked with the longest, and that will be the main focus of this talk is Serrata Nova Shasta, and that parasite is shown in this glass sculpture. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what mixozoans are and how they fit into the tree of life, the morphological features that both define the group and allow them to invade their hosts, and the ecological conditions that allow them to cause disease in wild fish. But throughout the talk, I'll explore how art has helped me to explain and explore these concepts. First, a little bit about my process. These are a few shots of my studio with the two kilns that I use um, for firing the glass. I use a couple different methods that I'll talk about in a minute. I have these different areas in the studio set up for um, <clears throat> polishing and grinding glass, for cast making plaster casts, uh, for screen printing, for photography, and as well as a small gallery space. This is my, my work area uh, where you can see jars of ground, ground glass and over here sheets of glass stored and workspaces and places to put pieces in progress. So I use a variety of different processes. And as you saw in an earlier slide of the Serrata Nova Shasta sculpture, this is a similar piece um, of a mixozoan that we've described called, it's a species of mixidium. This process is relatively simple. I use an electric engraving tool to draw or inscribe lines on a clear piece of glass. And then a fine enamel or paste of glass is then applied and rubbed into those lines. Then the excess is wiped away and that glass is fused in the kiln to about 1300 degrees to, to set that glass. Then another clear glass disc is layered on top of that. And these two pieces are fused together and you, you can see the bubbles created, which gives it kind of a watery feel, which, which really depicts the, the habitat for this, uh, this spore form. And if you think about how drawing 
is done. It's a slow, deliberate process. And it can really be considered as a way of knowing something. So these pieces have helped me to look more carefully and deliberately at the parasites that we work with and to think about the fine details and the structures that may facilitate their completion of their life cycle. Another method I use to create graphic images is screen printing. And in this case, instead of using ink on paper, I'm using enamel on glass. These pieces are then fused to, to uh, fix the image to the glass. And then I generally cut up those pieces and use them in larger pieces like this collage, which has several screen printed images in different layers. This is another example of how screen printed graphics can be used. It's a technique called graphic swim and the screen printed images here are again fired, then cut and layered and fused again. And here you see the second fusing process and the finished blocks that will then be stacked in an order and enclosed so that when they melt, they can flow over one of over one of top of each other. And what that does is create this swimming image. And this finished piece is that same mixidium spore that you saw in the previous slide, but it's overlain with a genetic code of the parasite and a few graphics from the, the manuscript that was published. And it's from a series that I'm calling abstracted, not only because it artistically abstracts the parasite spore, but because it also represents a scientific abstract where the key findings of the paper are described. Casting in glass is a similar process that, to the one that's used in metal called lost wax casting. And in this case, a plaster mold is created around an object, in this case, a scientific flask. And then a wax mold is created. And these waxes are then encased in plaster. And that plaster mold is filled with glass in a variety of forms here, marbles and fritz. And that is then fired. And then the, the clay, the plaster is broken apart um, to release the forms. And here you can see some of the finished flasks. Finally, Pat de Vere is a modification of casting, again using plaster molds. I use um, some of the uh, wax forms uh, created by lost wax casting and cover that in plaster. And then that open face plaster mold is then packed with layers of, of uh, powdered glass to create a very thin walled vessel. And here you can see some of the pieces after firing and then the finished uh, sculptural piece. But for me, one of the most useful processes has been collaboration. Just as the collaborations we form in science allow us to expand our toolbox of techniques and ideas, engaging artists has expanded my ability to reach people as well as to examine my own science through a different lens. So these are some of the collaborators that I've worked with over the past three years. And I'm going to weave their interpretations into this story. Here we have Andy Myers, a visual artist and instructor in the art department at OSU. Dana Reason, also here at OSU, she's the director of popular music studies. Christian Labor is a scientist and songwriter currently doing a postdoc um, in Switzerland. And Jason Fick, again here at OSU, he's a coordinator of music technology. And our dis interdisciplinary conversation starts with a river, it's salmon and a parasite. And the river that we work in now and is shown here is the Klamath River, but this could be any river here in the Pacific Northwest, as well as any species of salmon or trout. 
But the parasites in this story, Serrata Nova Shasta, has evolved a very specific relationship with its host. And I'm going to start with my collaboration with Chris, Christian Labor, who wrote a ballad uh, about Serrata Nova Shasta, which I think is a really nice abstract or introduction um, to this story. And I'm only going to play about two minutes of his video. And so if you want to hear the whole thing, you can go to his website. Okay, I think uh, you'll have to go to his website to hear that story. So a quick recap. The, the, uh, the parasite that I've spent the last 40 years researching is Serratanova Shasta. It's found only here in the Pacific Northwest and it only infects salmon and trout and it causes a disease of the infectional intestinal tract um, that looks like, like this. We can, call it rotting gut disease because it causes severe hemorrhaging and distension of the body cavity. If you open that fish up and looked microscopically at the intestinal tract, you would see these very tiny kidney bean shaped spores. The parasites endemic here in the Pacific Northwest, in fact, it's only found in this part of the world. And that's because of some characteristics of its life cycle that we'll get into in just a minute. Sea Shasta has a complex life cycle that requires an aquatic invertebrate, which is in this case, a tiny polychaete worm. These are about the size of uh, a large eyelash. They're very tiny. Within each of its hosts, the fish host and the worm host, the parasite has a developmental cycle that culminates in two very distinctive spore stages. The actinospore stage is released from the worm host and infects the fish host, and the mixospore stage is released from the fish host and infects the worm host. Both these spore forms are uniquely adapted to encounter their next host, either by sinking to the bottom of the river in the case of the mixospore, or floating in the water column until it encounters a fish in the case of the actinospore. And sea shasta is only one of thousands of mixozoans that infect a variety of hosts. Most of the hosts that we do know these parasites from are fish but they also infect other cold-blooded vertebrates as well as um, being detected in birds um, and a few terrestrial mammals. But in most cases, their invertebrate hosts are annelids, um, typically oligochaetes, but also polychaetes and also bryozoan hosts. When I began working with this group, they were classified as protozoans, and then they were assigned to a phylum of their own, the mixozoa. Because they didn't really fit in well anywhere, the mixozoans were kind of uh, apart from everything else, and, uh, but it allowed us that uh, ability to be experts on a whole phylum of organisms, which was kind of exciting. Um, however, as uh, molecular tools began to be better developed, um, we were finally able to resolve their home is within the phylum Cnidaria. And you probably are very familiar with different types of Cnidarians, sea anemones, corals, and jellyfish. These are all free living organisms. So what the addition of the Cnidaria, of the Mixozoa did to the Cnidaria was add this huge component that's completely parasitic. So it really changed how we think of this, this phylum. 
Um, but it also changed how we think about these parasites that we work with. We'd long known that mixozoan spores are a complex of three specialized cell types. We have a valve cell here on the outer part, depicted in this Pat DeVere piece as, as these kidney bean shapes. But internally, we have two spor sporoplasm cells, which will go on to create the next generation. And we have these two cells that have um, coiled tubules in them. These are what we now term nematocysts to be consistent with what they're called in other cnidarians. But these are the stinging cells of mixozoans, just like they're the stinging cells of jellyfish. And one of the things as biologists that we're interested in is how these spores form. And the process of spore development is actually something that we have to infer from looking at different stages under a microscope. And often these stages are all present at the same time. So we just um, put together a life cycle or a developmental cycle that looks like it makes sense. So it's kind of a best guess as to the actual flow of development. And so to explore the complexity of development in a different way, um, I've worked with uh, Andy and Dana Reason, and they collaborated on a um, interpretive piece that we will try to play now. But if this doesn't play, uh, you can find the full film on the ArtSide website. Choosing the more interesting looking parts of it for myself. Um, and I'll be working, it'll be somewhat of a time lapse. So I'm, I'm, I'll be working in stages and I'm working over top of those stages. So it'll be changing. And I'm responding to what Andy is putting up there. I know that we're going through five cycles we kind of pre, uh, we have some pre-compositional ideas that I'm using, but at the same time, like nature, I could respond differently if he responds, he makes a different move, I'm ready to, I'm poised to like also change my response mechanism on the, on the instrument as well. So we'll see what happens. He might just throw me a curveball and then I have different response. Mm -hmm. the uh, the full experience um, but you didn't get to really see what the uh, finished product for the drawing was so I'm going to do a time lapse of that so you can see what Andy's interpretation of the developmental cycle was <laughs> 
Okay. So it only partially likes some of these, uh, these videos. So we'll go back and try that again. Okay, so from that project, we moved on to explore how those singing, stinging cells or nematocysts of Mixozoans work. And uh, this was a collaboration with Dana. And in this piece, what we did was take a look at the actual process of Mixozoan polar tubule firing. And here you can see Ceratonova shasta spores They've been stained so that you can see when the tubule is fired. And this actually is a very rapid process. You can see it there. Um, we, in collaboration with researchers in Israel, we could measure the speed of those tubules firing and they're extremely rapid um, along the order for some species, not necessarily Ceratonova, but of being the speed of a bullet. Um, so one of the fastest biological processes on earth. Um, and what Dana did was take this data that we developed and develop a composition. So she, she sonified the data developed from that study. Oops. And I'm going to try and play you. Okay, we won't push our luck here. But I think that gives you an idea of what it might sound like if a polar capsules, when a polar capsule fires. And, you know, I never really considered that is a question. Um, we don't often think about sound when we're talking about microorganisms, but as these things move through water, and especially when they're creating a sound wave like they would be if they're firing that rapidly, um, that, is, that is sound. Uh, and whether or not that's perceived, perhaps it's a sound wave that's perceived by the parasite itself, by adjacent parasites, or by the fish, we don't know. But I think it, it just brings up an interesting question that I would have never considered had, had it had not been for this collaboration. So these collaborations, both scientifically and artistically, have led us to more questions. Um, science is, is a continuous process of asking questions. And scientifically, we're interested in whether during uh, the release of these filaments or tubules, whether toxins, toxins or venoms are released as uh, they are in jellyfish. Uh, we wanna know what these mixozoans have retained and lost compared to their free li living cousins on their, their road to parasitism. Um, and practically, can we block firing in this then prevent infection in the fish host. Artistically, what can we learn about structure and function if we examine from a different perspective? And can vibrational sound waves be detected by the fish or, or by other parasites? However, the capacity of these parasites to cause disease is not only just a function of its relationship with the fish, it's also affected by the physical characteristics of the river. So we need to look not only at the river surface, but below the water to understand how channel morphology affects flow and dispersal of waterborne parasites. And here you can see 
um, a LIDAR image of this is the Willamette River, but and this is the Klamath here, but this is another river where the parasite's endemic. Here's a cast piece and as part of a larger metal sculpture um, that I made in collaboration with some, a metal worker. And here's a naturalist notebook uh, series piece on the Klamath River. So different ways to look at the Klamath. We've been working on the Klamath River and Serrata Nova Shasta impacts on that system for nearly 20 years now. And during that time, it's certainly become evident that there are some very clear factors that are linked to severe disease. Um, to complete the life cycle, the parasite needs to multiply in both its hosts. So when large numbers of adult spawning salmon occur that are heavily infected, we have high numbers of mixospores. Um, similarly, large invertebrate host populations can amplify the parasite, but it also takes conditions, river, physical river conditions, where there are low and stable flows and high wa water temperatures. These both speed disease progression and they concentrate the waterborne parasite stages. And here is that larger Willamette River sculpture. So we've been involved in a monitoring program where we collect water samples and use a molecular assay to determine how many parasites are present in a liter of water. And then based on water temperature and flow, we can pre predict an expected level of disease in the juvenile salmon that are migrating out of the system. And in the Klamath during some years, you can see on this graph, we have a very low disease risk. But there are other years, 2009, 2014, somewhat high risk, certainly 2015, and, and actually this year is a very high disease risk. So because of this long-term data set, um, I was curious about some of the things that we might be able to explore if we combine some of the different variables and use a different way to look at them. So rather than by reading the data and looking at graphs of spore levels and water flow and temperature levels, if we could uh, maybe use music and listen to that data. And so the next co collaboration is with Jason Fick and hopefully we can make it at least part way through this um, sonification slide. But again, this will be pasted on the ArtSci website if we don't make it through, so. Okay. That was my last slide. So I'd like to thank all of you for your patience uh, with technology. Um, it doesn't appear that uh, these large files are very amenable to Zoom presentations. Uh, but I think it gives you an idea about how I've tried to weave my art into my science, but also to, to use collaboration in art like I use collaboration in science to give me different perspectives. So with that, I'll take questions. Thank you.